This is Sparta! All right, you hecking aces of base out there. What's going on? This is the worst cat, and we're here with another video. Um, so I gotta be honest, this video is in response to some of the things I've seen. And uh, to kill the suspense, I mean, it's already in the title. It's simply, when you're in a role-playing game, when you're taking part in a role-playing game, are you storytelling, or is it something else? Um, this was strange for me as, as a, a topic to conceptualize, because I... I have never come across anybody that has asked that question until the year 2020. <laughs> so um, maybe that tells you about something where I, you know, something about where I stand with this. And newsflash, uh, we're, we're telling fucking stories here. Um, so first, RPGs require a setting, right? They require a setting for your characters to interact with. So we're starting at setting, but that setting is not just a setting. It's not just a collection of rocks and trees and scenic villages or, you know, Mount Doom fucking looking things. Um, it's not limited to that. That setting already has lore attached to it. So it has a history. And you, you might dare make the proclamation that that history is actually a story in this setting. And it ends right where your characters pick up, right? So there are tales about the pre previous king or maybe a bloody civil war or maybe uh, the time of troubles when the gods came, but you know that happened before and it has changed the world in meaningful ways. But now here we are playing a game. And we have to use all of that detail to ground the player characters in the setting, to keep them on theme with the setting, so on and so forth. Um, that lore is going to make sure that your character's actions are consistent with the theme of the setting, um, which is why there's such an emphasis on understanding things that happened previously, right, in the game world, whatever game world that is. Um, you know, Warhammer... 40k it's understanding about the warp and the god emperor and all this other crazy stuff right those things are critical to understanding the setting that you're dealing with um and quickly characters that aren't on theme are always destructive in a world like that um especially in a fantasy setting warhammer is a great you know sci-fi space opera epic type setting uh, that definitely has fantasy elements, but it it holds true for something like that as well, where if you have a character that is ignorant to all of these things and is just so consumed by their own version of events um, that they don't end up interacting with the world in a way that's consistent with the theme and setting, they're always destructive. Um, it completely unravels the mystique of dealing with a new environment, a new culture, a new experience. Um, and it's not necessarily, I mean, it's always destructive to the immersion that you're trying to create, but it's always going to be destructive to that player that is, or that character that is um, just not buying in with things. A quick example would be if, uh, you know, a valley girl um, was magically transported into the Middle Ages and she still had her, you know, fucking double frappuccino milk, you know, soy milk latte situation going on. And, you know, walks into a town and like, oh, are you, you know, obviously you're well dressed, you're cleaned up, you're not, you know, covered in mud and shit like everybody else. You know, are you one of the king's uh, you know, entourage. Oh, I, I don't have a king. <laughs> I just, I do my own thing, you know. I don't recognize any king. I mean, first off, that's part of the patriarchy, don't you know? Um, 
jokes aside, the people that are observing this are going to be horrified. <laughs> because here is somebody denouncing the king and the throne. Um, and in the most flippant of ways. And that's a tension that people in the medieval era didn't want. Um, you didn't denounce the king. You didn't denounce the legitimacy of his rule. Um, and if you were standing in front of somebody's business or home or, you know, they were just milling about and then you started going off of the mouth like this, um, you'd probably be killed. Let's be, let's face it. Or they would just grab your ass and deliver you to the, the local constable, the local uh, official and be like, this person was denouncing the king. Uh, and, and they would happily do that. Right. So, I think I kind of drove the point home. Characters that are grossly off theme are always destructive forces for themselves and for the rest of the setting. Um, so, what what is the uh, what is the natural play out of not being on theme and all that kind of stuff? It's it's chaos. There's some unfortunate. Um, semantics that come into play when talking about this very topic of is role playing storytelling or is it not and it's rooted in in the start of some people think storytelling means dragging players through a story arc that's already been written um and essentially limiting or not allowing them to make meaningful connections meaningful interactions or contributions until they take the exact actions that have been pre-written that are going to move them forward along a story arc or a plot arc. Of course, that is not role-playing. Um, you know, there is actually some examples of modules, uh, especially in AD&D, that do those kinds of things. Mo one most notable one is the whole Dragonlance saga. Uh, I know Forgotten Realms has some of the same, uh, and if it's not you playing a very specific character that already, you know, we know this character lives at the end of the story and they defeat the evil wizard or whatever, um, it's, it's a very canned and scripted, you know, there are other forces at work in the world that are cooler than you that are doing cool and crazy things. And you get the feeling that what you're doing doesn't really matter so long as you live through whatever encounters this module happens to barf up at you. Um, and, you know, you can't get powerful enough, you can't get uh, good enough to negotiate serious obstacles and be proud of what you're doing because it throw, uh, usually the game will throw, or excuse me, each encounter throws ridiculously overweighted things um, in the areas that they intend this cool NPC to come save your ass. Uh, and it's really annoying. It, it is some of the worst examples, I will say, of gaming supplements or of adventure modules that you can take part in and, and buy and play. Um, now also, the Dragonlance Saga, um, going through the adventure of that particular group, uh, does the same thing. Uh, I, I want to say in the original DL 1 through 14, you actually play as the characters in the novels. Um, you have all the same experiences. You have all the same interactions that they do. Uh, some abbreviated for space. Um, but generally speaking, you, you follow the exact same path, the exact same arc, the exact same way. Now, to me, that is a horrible way to play a role-playing game. It always, in my experience, has appealed to people that were um, very inexperienced in playing role-playing games. And that inexperience bit is... Uh, it's kind of squishy because it doesn't matter how long you've been playing. If you haven't been engaging in a role-playing game, with original thought, with original ideas, and other people that do the same thing, um, then I guess you, you don't have the experience you need anyway, right? 
But it has been my experience that it's really only very inexperienced players that love the thought of living each moment of their favorite character through their favorite setting um, and, and acting out or, or role-playing each idiosyncrasy that you know they can um, to approximate something that would be or is in the direct image of a canon um, a, a canon event or story or, or whatever. Um, that's not creativity. It's, it's mimicry, it's duplication, it's a reproduction. Um, that is not what I'm talking about in the, in the least remote uh, kind of situation. The creativity when you're role-playing comes from imagining the events, experiencing the events of a unique character through the mentality and eyes of that fictional character in whatever way it can be imagined. Um, and I think you see where I'm going with this. The other side of that, if you're mimicking your favorite character and you're playing Strider or you're playing Tannis Half-Elven or you're playing Captain Spock or something, um, everything you do has to pass a purity test. Um, whatever engagement it is, whatever interaction it is, you're not handling those things in the way that you can imagine them. You're handling those things by bouncing it off of material that's already been generated and accepted as fact. And the closer you generate and you know act out the things that are accepted as fact, the easier it is to pass this purity test and then the people around you go, oh yes, that is how that character would notionally react to something. Um, so they're inherently at their core level different processes and that's what i'm trying to get across um i really haven't found a whole lot of people that like playing games like that um honestly very few adventure modules are written like that um some fall prey to the you know we're going to give you this overpowered npc to help everybody you know pat their little asses and wipe their little noses along the way um and and oftentimes you you get the idea that you know this is obviously some author's self-insert character but um you know it if you have dm'd for a little bit it's actually fairly easy to edit that shit out um so you can actually have a good time playing um so that's kind of the end of the whole unfortunate semantics piece um I think that's where a lot of the consternation comes from when people are like, no, of course not. We don't do storytelling. We do role playing or we play an RPG. But, you know, it's like the people that forget ATM stands for automatic teller machine or SUV stands for sport utility vehicle. No, I'm driving an SUV. Oh, you mean a sport utility vehicle? No, no, it's an SUV. Okay. But going back to the storytelling um and and the reason why this is such a thing is is actually due to an example i'll get to right after this so we start play in a role-playing game in the framing of a story a story that's already taken place because we have the setting and we have the lore to back it up uh the characters the non-player characters villains and challenges form the exposition and rising action the characters and the evil boss or the primary antagonist form what would be the climax. And the aftermath of everything mentioned, whether it's loot, losing friends, gaining new friends, um, all that kind of stuff, would be the falling action and resolution. That is the exact map of a plot development in a story. Carbon copy, right? So... What happens when you realize your group is skipping over all of that? Personally, I would kind of take a take an honest look at everybody at the table, including the DM, um, especially if you're the DM, right? But this conversation is for everybody. And I would take a measure of what 
what experiences are people playing at your table for? Like what gets them going? What gets them interested? What gets them salivating at the table for more? Um, and if you realize it's just a combination of, you know, depleting this hit point pool and then depleting that hit point pool and then making that saving throw and then, you know, obnoxiously rolling, you know, several handfuls of dice because they're maximized fireball, what the fuck spell. Um, you're probably playing in a pencil and paper role-playing game. Or excuse me, a pencil and paper video game instead of a pencil and paper role-playing game. Um, and I started my very, very first video with the statement that that's okay. It's completely fine to turn a role-playing game uh, dice system into a medieval fantasy tactical simulation or a medieval fantasy pencil and paper video game in this instance. Um, there, there's nothing wrong with that. But you also have to realize that these systems are optimized to tell a story, to tell a cooperative story with the people involved that are playing. And like I said, I, I really never ran into the an idea that went contrary to this until literally current year. Um, with, I guess, a, the caveat of one exception, but not it's not a, a full exception. So a while back, I was inter you know I was looking at Pathfinder because all my you know nobody was playing AD and D at all, uh, first or second edition, uh, and I couldn't talk anybody <laughs> into playing it either because everybody had you know bought way deep into 3.5 edition stuff, and you know they were starting to supplement their Pathfinder stuff with 3.5 edition stuff and like. All this shit was going on, and, and they had absolutely no interest to play AD&D in any you know way, shape, or form. So I was like, okay, I'm going to look at some Pathfinder stuff, look at what Piazzo or Piazzo or whatever it is has to offer. And it was kind of more the same, in my humble opinion. Uh, more polished than D&D 3.5. Great artists. Um, some really unique ideas. But very, very samey, in my humble opinion, at least to me. So I was like cruising around on their message boards, and I found a question um, posed in the subject line of the original poster of the OP. And it simply said, what character class do I need to play to kill an ancient red dragon? And I'm thinking to myself, okay, well, you know, somebody somewhere doesn't get it. Like... The, this is a really strange question to ask because, you know, yes, you can look at the Monsters Manual and, you know, get together a bunch of stats and, and all this kind of stuff and say, this is what I have to beat. But to me, there was just so much that that question lacked. There was so much awareness that question lacked. And I couldn't. I couldn't really fathom how somebody could get to the point where, you know, all they had to do was come up with a class to kill an ancient red dragon. And, you know, there were a bunch of answers that were thrown back and forth about what kit and what class and what prestige class and what feats and all this kind of stuff. How to min-max the shit out of everything that this person was, was doing. And... I forget the exact contents of my posts, but, you know, first I was like, well, I mean, I, I, I appreciate the question because it's definitely a provocative one, but you're never going to face a dragon like you were just going to walk into an arena and there it is and, and you're going to fight. Like, that doesn't happen with a dragon, much less an ancient red which is the most vulgar display of non-god power in most fantasy games. Um, I was like, first, how the fuck are you even going to find this thing's lair? Uh, and it was, there's actually a couple of people that, uh, that ended up commenting and kind of supporting my viewpoint. And one of the, 
one of the remarks was, if you know where a dragon is and you're hunting it, if you put your real body anywhere within five miles of its lair, you're doing it wrong. And I, I thought that was very, uh, very, just very on on point with with where I was going. And you know, I got a very brush off type response where it's like, oh well, you know, I'm just trying to figure out, you know, how I kill an ancient red dragon. And duh, right? And I was just like, okay. So then I was like, so, you know, assuming you put yourself within spitting distance of this thing somehow, um, you know, we're just going to use the magical hand of the narrative tool and wipe all of that away. Like you have to actually find it and you actually have to find its real layer and you have to get all the magical implements necessary you would need to infiltrate its real layer, assuming it's even on the same plane. Uh, of existence. We're just going to put you there with the dragon. We're just going to assume it. I was like, so this is an ancient red. Um, so first off, there are actually rules um, in the Council of Worms campaign setting for dragons to have classes. Um, and obviously it would be like an optional rule, but even if you didn't you know, buy fully into the Council of the Worms campaign setting and you wanted to do your own thing um, or, you know, stick to something that was more agreeable with the Monsters Manual, that's fine. Um, but it does provoke the question of this thing has had literally millennia to come up with, create, and imagine spells you've never heard about. <laughs> uh devious, destructive shit that you ha nobody has ever seen or heard about. And the fiercely competitive nature of ancient red dragons specifically would mean that they would never share them, right? They're going to come up with something that's so fucking nasty and so devious. They're just going to... It's going to be enough for them to have this smug little grin for damn near the rest of eternity for the next arrogant little bitch that tries to walk in and fuck with them. Like, think about that just for a moment. What kind of magic would this thing have access to that you don't? That you wouldn't even know to prepare for? You know, and then there's the layer itself. Um, a lot, I, there, admittedly, there's a lot of people a lot more knowledgeable than I am about how to run dragons where you have the layer actions and the uh, I forget if it's heroic actions or whatever it is, but yeah, all of that combined. Um, and then I brought up, oh, by the way, every time the dragon hits you with its breath weapon, literally every magic item you have has to make a save versus magical fire or be destroyed. Period. Um. You know, and I, I think I brought up a couple more things. Yeah, oh yeah, just like since it's a you know like going to be massive or gargantuan, whatever size class it would be, like all literally all it would have to do is squish you, like squish. Done, boy. What's up? Anyway, um, so obviously none of this was well received, and it was. It simply went back to, oh, well, you know, I'm not interested in whatever stupid version of dragons that you have is. I just want to kill an ancient red dragon that's in the in the monster's manual. Okay, God, that's such an easy concept that I can't believe you don't get it. <laughs> um, and that was really the first time I legitimately came across somebody that the only thing they wanted to do was obsess about the metagame properties of the dice system itself. That's it. There was no framing, no context, no setting, no story, no suspense. Um, they just wanted to kill an ancient red dragon so they could say, I have a, a single character that can kill an ancient red dragon. Um... And I, uh, I've, 
I will say I've not come across that um, since, but I definitely know it's out there based on some of the other replies that this guy was getting. And I, I don't know what to think about that. It's very obvious that something has changed um, when we kind of went from the, what I'm notionally old school Dungeons and Dragons to the new school of 3.5, Pathfinder, Pathfinder 2.0, etc., etc., etc. And it's not a good change. Um, I, it's, I guess it's not that I don't understand it. It's that at fundamentally, at, at, at my very core being, I don't agree with it because it's so antithetical to what you could be doing in a role-playing game and with with that same story even create or taking a fictional character a warrior through the journey of learning about dragons and developing an enmity that is so great and so seething that he he had he made it his personal goal to seek out the strongest dragon ever imagined and slay it himself that could be an epic story that I mean, it could be an incredible um, tale of subterfuge and betrayal and all this kind of stuff. Where you know, at first he's very vocal about, "Yeah, I'm a, I'm going to kill myself a dragon. I'm going to be a dragon slayer and I'm a warrior and doing all this." But then, like allies of said dragon, including wizards, including townspeople, including spies, including maybe the dragon himself, polymorphed into a human form. Um, start getting wise to this and start setting obstacles in his way. And then he realizes that, hey, it might not even be the forces of the dragon, but there's something in this world that is standing in his way and overcomes that stuff and becomes more cloistered about how he relates to people, what his goals are, and starts finding a secret society of dragon slayers and blah, 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 blah. Like, you could go on and on. And that, that's just shit from off the top of my head, man. Um, and build an amazing story with the simple premise of how do I build a single character class that can kill an ancient red dragon. Um, and, and we haven't even talked about what happens when he finally, at the conclusion of all of these epic adventures and near-death experiences, finally finds how to access the lair of the most powerful dragon ever known to live and is mostly chronicled in, in you know children's stories and, and fables and most people think it doesn't even exist anymore or never did but he finds it he finds the real one like that that is it has the makings of an epic campaign an epic story that would be hella fun to tell it's just all this dude wants to do is kill it. <laughs> like, just just put me in the same room and we'll roll the dice and I'll fuck this thing up. Like, yeah, totally cool. All right. What are we doing for the rest of the weekend? <laughs> like, I don't. I, 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 again, I understand it, but I don't get how someone can be so satisfied with again the metagame properties of the dice system because that's all it is at that point um and if you insist that there is no storytelling period in a role-playing game all you're really doing is smearing some cheap visuals over the metagame workings of a dice system and then animating it very poorly with combat miniatures if you even go that far um so that's my take on storytelling, and if it wasn't apparent in my four video series, How to Make Your Game Epic, or Epic Gaming, I ask four fundamental questions that are at the core of telling an awesome epic story. So hopefully that provides you a good perspective, or at least a different perspective, on how you thought about this stuff previously. Hopefully it gives you more ammunition to engage with your players and tell that epic story the way it's supposed to be told. Have a good one, mother... Oh, God. Peace.